This is going to be Genesis 38, and I'm going to talk about the subject of going downhill. In Genesis 38, you've got a chapter where it stops talking about Joseph and starts talking about his brother Judah. And in Genesis 38, one of Jacob's sons, which is Judah, goes down from his brethren. And he, inter he intermingles with people that he's not supposed to be mingling with. He begins to go downhill. And going downhill affects some things. Number one, it affects your fellowship. In Genesis 38, 1, it says, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren. Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. So Judah went down. He went down geographically, and he went down spiritually. He left his brethren. And as a saved person, when you stray from the brethren to go out in the world, you go downhill. Going downhill affects your fellowship. And when you lose fellowship, you start going down. Going downhill affects your fellowship and also your friendships. It says, Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. When Judah was going downhill, he was involved with a guy named Hira the Adolamite. Having bad friends can cause you to go downhill, and going downhill can lead to bad friends. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. That's what happened with Judah. He had evil communications. In Proverbs 13, 20, it says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. And Judah's not walking with wise men, and he's going to have some bad things happen in his life in this chapter. It says in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he, hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So you see, he started walking with the wrong crowd. He got with the wrong people. He got with Hira the Adolamite. He was unequally yoked together with the wrong people. And he ends up being unequally yoked together in his marriages. In verse 2 it says, And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went in and to her. Going downhill affects your friends, your fellowship, and your family. You see, he was unequally yoked together with this woman. And it affects his family. Judah had his family going hill, going downhill before it was even formed because he took the wrong wives. This led to him having some sons who were over much wicked. In Genesis 38, 3 through 7, it says, And she conceived, so this wife he took, she conceived and bare a son and called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son and she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Chizib when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose, ne whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Look at that. This guy was wicked in the sight of the Lord, one of Judah's sons. You see, he started off on the wrong foot by taking the wrong wife and he has sons that are very wicked and in ecclesiastes seven seventeen, it says be not over much wicked neither be thou foolish why shouldest thou die before thy time you see ur was over much wicked and there's a good chance that he was a sodomite and this is uh, possibly why he hadn't produced any children yet that you see, the first time the word wicked showed up, it was connected with Sodom. And if you look at that word wicked in the book of Genesis, most times it's connected with that sin. It, Genesis 13, 13 says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So Judah 
had a wicked son named Ur. He was over much wicked. Now notice the names of Judah's sons. If you look back up in those verses we just read, look at their names again, and let's talk about what those, those names mean. It's like they kind of reflect the things that Judah lost when he went downhill. Ur's name means watcher. You see, when you go downhill, what happens? You quit being watchful. Onan, his name means strength. A backsliding saint loses strength when he goes downhill. His strength is in the Lord, not in himself. He loses it when he goes downhill. Sheila means prayer. When you're going downhill, you quit praying. The uh, Chizib, where it says there in verse... Uh, five, it says, and she had again conceived and bare a son and called his name Sheila, and he was at Chezeb when she bare him. That word Chezeb means deceitful. When you go downhill, you get overcome by the deceitfulness of sin. And then the wife of Ur, her name is Tamar, and it means palm tree. You see, when you're going downhill, this world starts looking like a paradise with palm trees. And you forget about the real paradise that the Lord has for you. So those are the names of them. And I tried to get some application there out of the names, out of the meaning of those names. And uh, I'm not an expert or nothing, so I, I had to get the meaning of those names from somebody else, and I just have to take their word for it. But uh, that's just something to think about there. Looking at the meaning of their names... So Judah's son, Ur, gets slew by the Lord because he's wicked. And in verse 8, it says, And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. So go in unto thy brother's wife, he says, and marry her. So you see their marriage by flesh joining flesh. And since Ur is now dead, he won't be able to have a child by his wife, Tamar. So she doesn't have a child uh, there's no, uh, Judah doesn't have a son to carry the seed on. You see, Judah's the one who's carrying that promised seed. So as you would expect, one of his sons would carry on the promised seed after him. And Genesis 38, 9 says, And Onan knew that the seed shouldn't, should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground thus that he should give seed to his brother. Once again, Judah had a son who showed that he was over much wicked. And the major, the major sin here was the fact that he was not going to raise up seed in the place of his brother when he was supposed to. It wasn't the actual act that he did. Or A lot of people claim that this is uh, saying that you can't use any form of birth control or something like that. But I believe that the sin here was the fact that he wasn't raising up seed to his brother when he was supposed to. You see, the child would have been his brother, Ur's child by proxy. And this is possibly why Onan didn't want to do it. But uh, this uh, act he did in Genesis 38.10, it says, And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. So in just a few verses you have seen how Judah's family was affected when he was going downhill. It says in verse 11, Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Heir's wife, Tamar, he said, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Sheila, my son, be grown. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So Judah wants Tamar, heir's wife, to remain a widow until Sheila, Judah's last son, gets grown up. This way he can raise up seed in, in the place of Ur. You see, Ur and Onan are both dead, Judah's first sons, so now Tamar is going to have to wait for Sheila to grow up. And in verse 12, it says, And in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted, and went up unto his sheep shears to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. So Judah's wife dies. It, just in this chapter, he's lost two sons, he's lost his wife, and I'm not saying that losing family members has to do with the saint being backslid or going downhill. But in, in Judah's case, that seems to be what's happening. 
similar to the case with King David losing his child because of his sin with Bathsheba. But, you know, that doesn't mean if you've lost a child that you were backslid or something, or it's because of you. But in these two cases, that seems to be what's going on. But also notice that Judah is still walking with his friend, Hira, the Adolamite. He's not walking with God. He's still got that evil communications going on. And going downhill, Judah ends up, this is the next thing, Judah ends up deceived by an harlot. That's the next point. Judah's deceived by an harlot. In Genesis thirty-eight thirteen through 14, it says, And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put her widow's garments off from her, and she covered her with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath, for she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. So Tamar is upset because Judah's son Sheila is grown up now, and Judah promised that he was going to give her to Sheila to wife, yet she's not been given to him to marry. Now remember, Judah told her that. He told her to remain a widow at her father's house until Sheila was grown. And she did, and Ju Judah has not come through with what he promised. So, you know, she has a right to be mad. So when she finds out that uh, Judah's going up to Timnath, she disguised herself as an harlot. Now what she does is obviously wrong here. You know, she's rightfully mad, but just because you're mad doesn't mean you have to go and do something like she's about to do. In Genesis thirty-eight fifteen, it says, When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot, because she had covered her face. And you know, in Proverbs, uh, Solomon talks about those who wear the attire of an harlot. So there is a type of clothes that somebody wears that can make them appear to be an harlot. You see, when you're going downhill, you are much more vulnerable to deceivers. Judah gets deceived by an harlot. He thought that Tamar is an harlot, even though it's his daughter-in-law. And she plays it off really good. And in Proverbs six twenty-five through 26, it's talking about the harlot, the strange woman. It says, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. That's exactly what happens here with Tamar and Judah. In Proverbs 7, 7 through 10, it says, And behold, among the simple ones I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She had the attire of an harlot just like Tamar had the attire of an harlot. And Judah was deceived by her. It says in verse 16 and 17 in Genesis 38, And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? So she wants him to send a kid from the flock. And, you know, he's going to, but she wants him to give a pledge till he gets it sent. And the pledge is something that will give security for the future payment of the kid of the flock. So he's deceived by an harlot while he's going downhill. And the next thing while he's going downhill, he defiles his name. He gets deceived by an harlot and defiles his name. In verse 18, it says, And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? You know, what future payment, what payment, or what security can I give you to show you that I'm going to be honest about giving you this payment in the future? He said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her. And she conceived by him a signet that she he, she wants his signet. And a signet would have been uh, like a ring that had his name on it. So that he could take that ring and, and could use it to 
impress his name in the clay tablets and things like that. In Exodus 28, 11, it talks about a signet and it says, With the work of an engraver in stone like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. So that signet was like a ring that he could use to put his name on stuff. And that's why I say he went downhill, he defiled his name. When you go downhill, you'll defile your name. He gave this woman an opportunity to run his name through the mud. In Proverbs 22, 1, it says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. In Ecclesiastes 7, 1, it says, A good name is better than precious ointment. You see, a good name is better to be chosen than temporary pleasure with an harlot. When he went downhill, he was deceived by an harlot. He defiled his name, and he ditched possessions. In Genesis thirty-eight eighteen, it says, And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets, and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. So he gave her his bracelets as well. And in Genesis twenty four twenty two, Abraham's servant's going out to look for a bride for Isaac. And he finds Rebekah and he gives her some bracelets. You see, Rebekah is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he actually gives her some bracelets. And that picture is how the Lord's probably going to give uh, the, his bride gold and precious stones. And maybe some bracelets at the judgment seat of Christ. You see, Judah gave her his bracelets. This can picture how a saint going downhill trades his possessions, his heavenly rewards or possessions, for the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, when you leave the narrow way and go down the way of a transgressor, you ditch your heavenly possessions. And Judah is also found dropping his weapon. He's deceived by an harlot. He defiles his name, ditches some of his possessions, and drops his weapon. It says in verse 18, in Genesis 38, And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. You know, in Psalms it says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. You know, Judah, he had his weapon in his hand. He had his staff in his hand. But it says, And he gave it her. You see, she was trying to take everything he had on him. You know, she's trying to bring him down to a piece of bread. But she got his staff. You see, during your backslid condition, you will find that you drop your weapon. Your wide margin King James Bible gets put on the shelf. You quit writing in it. You dropped it. You dropped your weapon. Uh, one of the things that a deceiver wants to do is take away your weapon. The staff was his source of defense. The Bible is your source of defense. The deceiver couldn't take his weapon, couldn't really take it from him. Judah had to hand it over. It says he, he gave it her. Uh, the devil can't take the word written in your heart. You have to willingly give in to temptation. And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. Judah's sons, Ur and Onan, were supposed to have a child by Tamar. They didn't. Uh, Judah promised Tamar a child with Shelah. He didn't keep his word. Tamar's upset. Now Tamar has deceived Judah into laying with her, and now she is going to have a son by Judah. And in Genesis uh, thirty-eight nineteen, it says, And she arose and went away and laid by her veil, laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. So she ditched the disguise and puts back on the garments of her widowhood. Many times after you have fulfilled your sinful desire, you can see the deception for what it really was. The deceiver took off her garments that she was deceiving with and put back on her real garments. You see, it looked sweet in your lust, the thing did. And you enjoyed the pleasure of sin that lasted for a season. And that thing that deceived you took off its disguise. Then you could be able to see it for what it really was. Now Judah hadn't seen her yet and saw her for what she really was. But that's the way sin is. It looks good to you in its disguise. But then after the act, it takes off the disguise. And you can see it for what it really is. 
And in Genesis 38, 20, it says, And Judah sent the kid, you know, the kid of the flock of the goats that she wanted. You know, he's keeping his word here. He sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adullamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Notice that Judah is still in fellowship with the wrong friends. His friend is still Hira the Adullamite. And this friend of his was going to take the kid, you know, the goat, to the harlot, Tamar, but she was nowhere to be found. He wanted to get his pledge back. You know, those things that he temporarily gave her until he could get the payment to her. His signet and his bracelets and his staff. Of course, the Adolamite can't find her. And this shows that worldly friends can't help you find what you're looking for. Adolamite was zero help to him. He didn't have any spiritual discernment to see what had happened either. Both of their minds were blinded by deception. You'll notice that a harlot is associated with deception here. This should remind you of the great whore in Revelation 17, 18, who deceives billions of people with her false religion. And in Genesis 38, 21, it says, Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. Notice that harlot was by the wayside. And in the parable of the sower, in, in the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, some seeds fall that way. In Matthew 13, 4, it says, When he had sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. You see, that word that Judah had heard about the Lord from his fathers had fallen by the wayside. He had forgotten about them. And that harlot was openly by the wayside, walking around. Tamar was out there looking to deceive Judah, walking around by the wayside. When you drive down the road, you see sin openly by the wayside. It's no longer behind the counter of the store. It's in your face, and it can cause you to fall. The, the men of that place told the Adolamite that there was never a harlot there. They're like, there was never a harlot here. You see, it was all an illusion. You see, if you go back to the sinful places you were, or you think back to when you were in your sin, you'll see that all the pleasure was fake. It was temporal. It was a waste of time. It wasn't real. You just thought it was in the moment. Just like Judah thought, he just had a harlot here. Nobody's going to know about it. This isn't anybody that I know. It's nobody special. It was an all an, an illusion. It, it was Tamar the whole time. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men in the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. So notice he said, Lest we be shamed. Judah is worried that the word about this is going to get out, and it's going to bring shame to his name. He should have, bought, he should have thought about defiling his name sooner. He should have thought about not giving his signet out like that. You see, when you go back and do the things you used to do, you're at risk of bringing shame to your name. And in Romans 6.21, it says, What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The harlot is associated with deception, associated with shaming. In this present evil world, there is a lot of sexual sin going on and a lot of shaming held over the heads of people who've committed this secret sexual sins this is used for blackmail it's used for money you see when you see a politician or celebrity that's doing things that are over much wicked and beyond the natural man and you you uh you think well how can a, a natural person do this you see there's a good chance something is being held over their head sometimes they say things or do things and you think to yourself how can they be that wicked maybe they really aren't that wicked maybe someone much more wicked behind the scenes has control over them, threatening them with shaming their name if they don't do this or they don't do that. One danger of committing these types of sins, as Judah did, is that a person can hold it over your head. They can use it to keep you quiet. They can use it to make you say things that matches their agenda, even though you may not agree with it. You see, Judah started going downhill when he went down from his brethren. When you're going downhill, you many times can't see your own sins and faults, but you can see everyone else's. You see, Judah had this problem. Remember, he just committed sexual sin with Tamar. 
He was deceived by the harlot, and now he's dishing out a punishment to that same harlot. That's the next point. He's dishing out a punishment. In Genesis 38, 24, it says, And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burnt. About three months after Judah fornicated with Tamar, it's found out that she is with child, and Judah is quick to dish out a punishment on Tamar. Judah wants her to be brought forth to be burnt. Many times this is the case for everybody, because you see everyone else's sins, but you give yourself a free pass. Even though you're committing a similar sin, the same sin, or something even worse, and you're quick to burn somebody else for what they're doing. You see, we should judge. we got the right to judge. And if you don't make judgments, then you're not going to do right and live right yourself. Because you've got to judge whether something's right or wrong, whether somebody's doing something right or wrong, whether you should do that yourself or not. But you see what's going on here is hypocritical judgment, and that's the judgment that's spoken of against in the Bible. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 1 through 5, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And while beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So you see, the Bible is not against judgment, it's against hypocritical judgment. When you've got a similar sin going on, the same kind of sin, something even worse, you have no right going around telling everybody else what they need to stop doing, what their punishment should be. First, get the mote out of your own eye, and then you, you can see clearly to say something about somebody else. But uh, Judah, he could dish out a punishment. And it says in Genesis thirty-eight twenty-four, And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burnt. When she was brought forth... She sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these, the signet and bracelets and staff? Tamar came to her father-in-law Judah, and she lays out before him the signet, the bracelet, and the staff. And as soon as he sees those things, he knows what he's done. He knows that He's dished out a punishment. And the next point, he knows he's deserving of the judgment that he's placed on Tamar because he's the one that laid with Tamar. And it said in verse 24, And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, let her be burnt. You see, a lot of times we see the sins of others as something a lot worse than our own sins. Judah was ready to burn Tamar over something that he was involved in himself. This is the way the Pharisees were. They were hypocrites. They were ready to stone the adulteress with stones when they were adulterers themselves. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these, the signet? and bracelets, and staff. And as soon as Judah seen the signet, bracelets, and staff, he knows he's the guilty man. It was like when Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. And I want to point uh, out the, this similar case with King David. After he's committed the sin with Bathsheba, you see, he took Bathsheba, even though he had already had other wives, and Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. You see, David's already got multiple wives. Uriah over here has the one wife, Bathsheba, and David feels the need to take his wife as well. And David's prophet, Nathan, comes to confront David about his sin with Bathsheba, and he uses a story to do so. And in 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 4, 
It says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him, and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children, and it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wafering man that was coming to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Now notice David's anger toward the rich man for taking the poor man's lamb. It says in Second Samuel twelve five, And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. So you see, David's quick to pass the judgment, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. See, he's ready to dish out a punishment on a man that did the same thing that he's done himself. But look at what Nathan says next to David. It says in 2 Samuel 12, 7, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. You see, similar story. Both David and Judah passed judgment when they did the same thing themselves. Both David and Judah have the same hard attitude towards their sin being exposed. And that's what makes them special. You see, they both get things right. And it makes sense that David is from the tribe of Judah. And this is where Judah is going to come through and prevail. This is the attitude of, that every saint should have when he gets off into sin and his sin gets exposed. Look at what Judah does when his sin is exposed in Genesis 38, 26. And Judah acknowledged them. Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila my son, and he knew her again no more. Judah acknowledged those items as his. He acknowledged his guilt of sin. He even takes it a step further and says that Tamar hath been more righteous than himself. Just like in Matthew 21, 31, the publicans and harlots were more righteous than the Christ-rejecting Pharisees. And then it even says he knew her again no more. He acknowledged what he had done. He said that Tamar was more righteous than him. He denies his own righteousness. And then it says he knew her again no more. A complete turnaround of attitude. Uh, he realizes he should have given Tamar his son that he had promised. What led to her deceiving Judah was the fact that he deceived her, which is also wrong. And instead of the seed going through Onan, Ur, or Shelah, Judah's sons, it comes through Judah with Tamar and comes through Pharaoh's. And that's going to be uh, Tamar's son, Pharaoh's. And in Matthew 1, 3, it shows you this. If you look at Matthew 1, 3, it says, And Judas, that's going to, that's not Judas Iscariot, that's Judah. And Judas beget Pharaoh's and Zerah of Tamar. And Pharaoh's beget Ezram, and Ezram beget Aram. So you see, just in this story from Genesis 38, this is referring to the line of the Lord Jesus Christ that you see in Matthew chapter 1. And in Genesis 38, 27, it says, And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. And this isn't the first twins in the Bible. You also had Cain and Abel. You also had Esau and Jacob. But she's in travail with these twins. And that means she's laboring in pain having these two children. And I've heard some people say that they don't want to have children because it would hurt. And I can't speak on it because I'm a man, obviously, but... There's some great verses for this. And in John 16, 21, it says, A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. When you're in travail, you will have sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. For a good mother, when the pain is over, it was all worth it. And I've heard mothers say they want to go back and do it all over again just so they can experience seeing their child come into the world another time the pain is all worth it 
And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. The one who stuck his hand out was named Zerah. And this is the first time uh, the word scarlet is used, and it's connected with a harlot. This is significant because in Joshua 2.18, Rahab is told to bind a scarlet thread in her window so that she's going to be spared when Israel wipes out, Ju uh, wipes out Jericho. And you know what? Rahab is also a harlot. Scarlet is a bright red color. Since it's associated with harlots, I'd say this is where you get the saying red light district. But that's something, that word scarlet, first time it shows up, it's associated with a harlot. It shows up another time associated with a harlot. It says in Genesis thirty-eight twenty-nine, it came to pass as he drew back his hand that behold, his brother came out and she said, how hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore, his name was called Pharez. So Pharez means a breach. And when Zerah took his hand back, see, he put his hand out, but when he took it back, Pharez jumped in front and came out first and became the firstborn. And, it, and afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerah. So Zerah had a, a hand out first. He was almost the firstborn, which would have put him in the line of Christ instead of Pharez. When he put his hand out, the midwife put a scarlet thread on him, but he pulled it back in, and then his brother Pharez came out first. The one with the scarlet thread comes out second. And we know that the scarlet thread is a picture of the blood of Jesus Christ. So what this can picture is how your second birth, your new birth, when you were born again, is the one with the scarlet thread. When you got born the second time, you got the blood applied. When the second child came out here in this chapter, he's the one that had the scarlet thread, picturing the second birth that has the blood applied. So Pharaoh got to be in the line of Christ because he was born first. But Zerah got to be a type of being born again because the scarlet thread pictures the binding of the blood of Christ that happens at the second birth. You'll notice that many times, most times, the second birth is better. For example, Cain and Abel. Abel was better. Esau and Jacob. Jacob was better. Uh... Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac was better. Here, uh, it turns out the one that came out first gets to be the, in the line of Christ, but the second one that came out had the scarlet thread. Your first birth was bad. Your second one is the one that got you in. So you see that picture all the way through the Bible. But this has been Genesis 38... What happens when you go downhill? Messes up your fellowship. Messes up your friendships. Messes up your family. You get deceived. You you ditch your possessions. You defile your name. You start dishing out punishments to others when you're the one that deserves that punishment yourself. But all you got to do if you if you if you've gone downhill. John makes it clear. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You just get back into fellowship and pick back up right where you left off.